I'm Keith Garabian, and I just want to introduce my 27th book, which is called Mini Musings, Miniature Thoughts on Theater and Poetry. And here's the wonderful cover by David Morato. And I do want to thank Guernica, especially Anna, Connie, and most of all, Michael Marola, who edited it for me. Now, this book came into being, uh, it was inspired by the American playwright Sarah Rule, who published a book called A Hundred Essays I Didn't Have Time to Write, which had covered a vast number of subjects, not all of them necessarily related. My book focuses on two subjects which are my obsessions as a writer and as a person, theater and poetry. So it's divided into two sections. Uh, I'll just give you a brief uh, sense of what the book has. Um, the uh, little essays in the theatre section uh, speak to some of my curiosities and obsessions, such as acting technique and acting issues, uh, such as the private self and the role, the stage as a public forum, community theatre, pioneers and geniuses, the role of imagination, the role of feet, theatre as a responsibility, etc. This section invokes, invokes famous acting icons such as Laurence Olivier, William Hutt, Heath Lamberts, and Vanessa Redgrave. It makes gestures of homage to the likes of Tennessee Williams, Ibsen, and Chekhov. It also invokes great acting teachers and actor writers such as Sanford Meisner, Stella Adler, Tadashi Suzuki, Simon Callow, and Oliver Ford Davies. I mix vignettes and anecdotes, impressionistic perspectives on Vivian Lee and Cherry Jones, for instance, historical subjects such as boy players, memorable first nights, tributes, and slices of autobiography. And then, of course, the poetry section is saturated with personal interests and obsessions. It, too, is sometimes anecdotal without cancelling meditation. Uh, the miniature essays are sometimes satirical, sometimes didactic, but never in an academic manner. And the section makes reference to poetry from Armenia, Japan, Iran, England, Canada, and the US. The breadth of its cosmopolitanism is not intended to be merely exotic, but to take a small measure of poetry's internationalism. All right, I'm going to now read from the theatre section, and again, I'll be excerpting it. I don't have enough time to cover it all. This one's about Robert Lepage's Theatre of Technology. He has been called a magician of images with a special theatrical language, a visual, sound-based, musical, and only incidentally text-based language. Suitcases, backpacks, duffel bags, shoes, glass balls, flasks, Baskets, dolls, cigarettes, puppets, screens, mats, mirrors, computers, cameras, microphones, and video screens populate his productions, forcing actors to coexist with these objects. And it is true that he creates fascinating, sometimes complex images in which lighting becomes part of the emotion of a scene, where photography is metaphor related to memory and where video divides space into different facets of the same reality, creating a visual architecture, as it were. But is this enrichment or a confusion of realms, or both? We do not need to be narcotized by the morphine of academics to understand that Lepage makes a strong case for theater as a contemporary visual language. He seems to be suggesting that we cannot practice theatre today as if there had been no photography, cinema, computers, the internet, virtual environments, and the evolution of visual arts. He saturates the stage with heterogeneity. His champions assert that he stages technology, dramatizing it. So where does this leave the actor? He is subordinated to technology, to the machinery that is present on stage. In other words, he is dehumanized. Lepage would possibly argue that on the contrary, the actor is doubled or tripled by some of the stage technology because his very form is multiplied by visual effects, such as the split screen technique. Just as an audience is when it gazes at the visual image, drawing itself into the image's center. And yet it's also possible to argue that the actor and audience are so immersed in the image that they become 
its prisoner. Lepage's form of meta-theater is fascinating, but its evident limits are equally fascinating. A great play can have an afterlife because of its language, characters, and exploration of storytelling. Can a theater built primarily on technological effects have such an afterlife? And now I'll skip to a short one from the poetry section. And this one is headed Post-Holocaust Poetry. Theodore Adorno asserted that there could be no poetry after the Holocaust. To write poetry after the Holocaust is barbaric. A harsh, devastating generalization, an overstatement that has been challenged triumphantly by such poets as Paul Celan, Irving Layton, Charles Simic, and Peter Balakian. Whether the poetry is a catalogue of horrors, souvenirs of hell, or a mirror that reflects man's most awful image is almost beside the point. History and historical atrocity are visors that grip us in the shadows of life. Art, especially poetry, is a way of freeing us from that vice. Speechlessness, which is a synonym for silence, is a dastardly effect, a crippling condition that is inimical to civilization and culture. Good poetry is not, of course, a department of complaints, but it is worthy of our humanity to look into the long mirrors of history with our fists clenched fiercely at our side our minds scanning time as death continues to play tag with little children, leaving nothing behind but their shadows. Such poetry gives us truths and tunes to hum while walking past endless graveyards. Thank you, and for more, please get the book. Thank you. <laughs>